Interior, the iconic Chemo Theater Day. Legendary New Mexico host Chad Brummett welcomes the audience to the latest episode all about the movies. From the first frame shot in the state to the latest Hollywood blockbuster, it's lights, camera, and action. Well before Walter White, I am the danger. Aliens bent on world domination. And the Duke himself were making movies in New Mexico. Come with grit teeth. Because gentlemen, that's when school really begins. Thomas Edison's company brought the emerging technology of motion pictures through the Isleta Pueblo, capturing what is widely regarded as the first film shot in the state, an actuary or documentary called Isleta Day School. The clip runs less than a minute, but its impact on what would eventually become a multi-million dollar industry for the state is immeasurable. Silent films are were one of what I consider one of the main times of filmmaking in New Mexico. Filmed in 1897, it kicked off the silent era of cinema in the land of enchantment. Between the years of 1908 to 1929, approximately 60 movies were made here, many of them by Romaine Fielding, who is considered the father of filmmaking in New Mexico. Fielding brought the base of his operations to Las Vegas, occupying the now famous Plaza Hotel. He brought top talent from the coasts to New Mexico, a practice still employed today to make movies. Sadly, however, the bulk of his work was lost to a studio fire in 1914. Film at that time being uh, like uh, with nitrates was extremely flammable, which caused a lot of theater fires as the years went by too. But the floodgates were open for film throughout the state, with such high profile names as Tom Nix, Mary Pickford, and the controversial director of Birth of a Nation, D.W. Griffith, all shooting here. <laughs> The addition of sound in the late 1920s changed the way movies were made. The spectacle of cinema grew, as did the roster of stars working in the state. Lionel Barrymore and an up-and-comer named Ronald Reagan shot the bad man here. It was a pretty busy time because there was a new concept. Films were a new concept then. Deborah Kerr, Bob Hope, Errol Flynn, Jimmy Stewart, and even Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis all called the state home during production. And in 1968, a spaghetti western star named Clint Eastwood brought the first big budget film to southern New Mexico with Hang 'em High. You hang a man, you better look at him. The late 1960s were revolutionary for many reasons. The counterculture indie feature Easy Rider, partially shot in New Mexico, was released and newly elected Governor Dave Cargo's cabinet set up the nation's first film office, recognizing the financial potential the industry could provide to the economy. You, I'll make you famous. The 80s and 90s saw the resurgence of Billy the Kid with Young Guns and Young Guns 2, shooting throughout locations in northern New Mexico. And Robert Redford's Milagro Beanfield War, inducted into the New Mexico Film and Television Hall of Fame in 2018, was shot in Truchas, Santa Fe, and Española. While the film reportedly lost money at the box office, it has become a cult favorite for New Mexicans. So New Mexico, it's like they pinpoint everything from names to beans to trucks to you name it. Then in 2002, the game changed completely. Legislators introduced New Mexico's tax incentive, which offered a 25% rebate on taxable expenses directly related to filming. Scores of movies and TV shows started working here, with notables like 310 to Yuma, The Book of Eli, and The Avengers all taking advantage of the policy. But after Breaking Bad and the success of Breaking Bad, um, things just really went through the roof because they really, really used New Mexico as New Mexico. Thus far, Berg estimates the total number of films shot in New Mexico is around 830. And the good news is, that number continues to grow. Well, we are underway on this episode of Legendary New Mexico at the Movies. When we come back, a business making Benjamins even Jesse Pinkman could appreciate. The film business supports local business, and for some, the film industry has created dream jobs that would have never happened without the cameras rolling in our state. So I hope you brought Thank that you. stacks, yo. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. Few movies and TV shows have had as great an impact on Albuquerque, and New Mexico for that matter, is Breaking Bad. It's actually changed our life pretty, pretty, I mean, rapid. 99.9% sugar, yo. Jackie Sandoval is co-owner of the Breaking Bad RV Tours, which has been pounding the pavement of Albuquerque for more than five years now. I was working for a funeral home before, 
and I got laid off. Her husband and co-owner of the tours, Frank Sandoval, left a job with Hewlett Packard to join his wife in an endeavor closer to their heart, an opportunity that would not exist without the film industry. The Motion Picture Association of America does great research on small business and film and TV. They recently released a study and it shows that the film and TV industry is essentially a network of small businesses. And I think it was in 2017 or 2018, they approximated that the industry supported um, and paid out to 89,000 small businesses nationwide. According to the Albuquerque Film Office, film production spent nearly $514 million for goods and services from local businesses between 2010 and 2014. We are starting to see um, local small businesses that are looking to expand, or already have expanded, to meet the demands of the film industry, which is incredibly exciting. Local businesses like Racks and O'Malley's Glass have seen an uptick thanks to construction and production needs. Black Duck Embroidery processes orders for wrap gifts for cast and crew. And Heritage Hotel's latest property, Hotel Chaco, was built with high-profile filmmakers in mind, looking for nothing short of the best in accommodations while working in the state. So this is like the new Hollywood. Similar to the Star Tours of Tinseltown, the Breaking Bad RV Tour takes fans on a three-hour excursion of more than 20 filming locations, all while riding on a well-detailed replica of the Crystal Ship, surrounded by dozens of props, many from the actual show. Yo, Mr. White, science! I'm just really thankful and grateful for this business and for the fans especially because without you, we would not have this. Since the RV hit the roads of Albuquerque back in 2014, more than 6,000 guests have taken the tour, giving the Sandovals a lucrative career in one of the many ancillary businesses that thrive because of New Mexico's film industry. We've made uh, last year over 280,000 just to give you a little bit of a mild number. Even Jesse Pinkman could appreciate all those Benjamins. Yeah, Now the Sandovals are also actors, and like hundreds of others, they have been in front of the cameras of most of our state's casting directors, a union of workers with a unique bond. The movie business has sometimes been called a boys club. According to womeninhollywood.com, of the 100 top grossing movies released in 2017 and 2018, only 18.5% of directorial jobs were filled by females. Additionally, only 14% of the screenwriters and 21% of producers were women. Sophia, you're Yet next. Yet there is one department of production that is clearly dominated by women, one that to actors is one of the most important jobs. All right, Vinny, let's go cast. Come on. Backstage.com's list of the top 25 casting directors in film and television show a major tilt toward women in the job, with a whopping 74% leading the departments of casting. And here in New Mexico, that percentage is 100. I think that women are really attracted to the job of casting director because it does incorporate, I think, a lot of the skills that we feel that we have in our lives, things like intuition, um, organization, um, communication. Catherine Brink has been working in New Mexico's film industry for more than 20 years. Having a bachelor's in theater directing, she found her way to the set through line producing. Action. And the more that I had the opportunity to do casting in the midst of the things I was producing, the more I realized I preferred it. The unsung heroes that can make or break the success of a film, casting projects can last days, weeks, and even months. So from the time we get a script, we break it down for characters, we kind of go through and um, develop a character breakdown, but you really develop, you know, a, a character on paper. Angelique Minthunder has worked as locations casting director on such films and TV shows as Sergeant Will Gardner, Shot Caller, Captain Fantastic, and Longmire. There's a lot uh, that goes into making cast deals, there's cast clearances, there's deal memos and contracts. On um, the days that we have auditions, callbacks, the sessions, meetings, when we talk with the director and we, we do all the creative stuff, that's the good stuff. After working in front of the camera for a brief stint, Mid Thunder was hired as locations casting assistant for Joedna Bolden, who has worked on such Academy Award winning features as Crazy Heart, No Country for Old Men, and the dark neo western Hell or High Water. There was a day player that I cast in that. The T-Bone Waitress, the, the, the big battle axe woman is, what don't you want? So what don't you want? 
she ended up getting to walk the red carpet with all the stars of the show and they flew her around the country and because it was just such a such good casting I don't know <laughs> I mean she just did such an incredible job I had people come up to me and say say you must have gotten a real waitress and it's like no a real waitress wouldn't have been that good of an actor roles like this being cast out of New Mexico would have been impossible were it not for the growing number of opportunities for training and for work here in the state opportunities due in large part to casting directors like Bolden Brink and Mid Thunder fighting for local hires against the big wigs in LA and New York. The cream rises to the top, it really does. I mean, if you're a good actor, then you're gonna start getting cast. And just getting into the audition room with the casting director is a testament to their faith in the talent of New Mexico. I want, I want everyone to do well. We wanna look good. We wanna be able to present the very best of who you are as an actor in the room. And the only way we can do that is if you understand that we're working together with you. We try to make our office comfortable. I have my dog here. You know, he helps people relax. And if an actor comes in and takes off their shoes, I love it. Just like you're that comfortable that, you know, I'm not intimidating you, that, that you can just relax and be yourself. Cut. Now along with these ladies, Faith Hibbs-Clark and Kira Arai are busy booking projects from ultra-low budget features to multi-million dollar blockbusters. Well, stay with us folks after the break, a day in the life of one of New Mexico's busiest working actors. A working actor can often go from making six figures one year to being on unemployment for half of the next. But as you'll see, most actors aren't doing it for the money. It's a typical Monday morning for actor Vic Browder. It's 11 a.m. and he's already preparing for his second audition of the day. The first, a self-tape submission sent digitally online. Well, mostly I'm just making sure all of my choices that I've made are correct and right. Um, and I feel good. With script in hand, along with his headshot and resume, he is moments away from another audition. A process Vic has known since childhood. I kind of had a rough childhood, you know. It was, um, I grew up in Vegas. Um, kind of on the streets, pretty poor, um, and there was this opportunity to do a show, and I was like, okay, cool, dig it. It's me, Bo Grites. Vic's credits read like a greatest hits of New Mexico made films. A success story that started with a simple motivation. Honestly, the, the, the reason I got into the theater and started acting is to meet girls. Browder's inciting incident for performance expanded well beyond those original objectives, receiving his undergraduate degree from Southern Utah University and an MFA in acting from Florida State University, considered at the time to be one of the top 10 institutions in the country for the degree. As a young adult, the craft and the passion for storytelling became all-consuming. It was juicy. It was an outlet for me. Um, it was therapy for me. I really enjoyed our little chat. And now it's time for you to go. Honestly, I never thought I'd be a professional actor. I thought I'd go to grad school, get my master's degree, and then be able to teach because I, I have a passion for that as well. Let's read that scene again. Browder teaches acting classes from time to time at one of Albuquerque's premier studios for the craft, Soul Acting. And like many working actors, Vic has made ends meet in a variety of non-showbiz ways as well. I've done everything from dig ditches to sell diamonds. In fact, the sobering odds of acting professionally aren't great. Robert Cohen, author of Acting Professionally, once said that you have just as good a chance of winning a seat in the Senate as you do sustaining a career for 10 years solely based on acting. One of the best things I ever did for myself <clears throat> to sustain, sustain myself while I was trying to make it you know, uh, is I went back to massage school. And as any actor will tell you, they take from nearly every experience in their life and cultivate it into their art form. And that, that changed my perspective on how, honestly, how the universe works. Off the screen and stage, Vic pours his energy into running Mother Road Theater Company, of which he is a founding member. He wraps up his Monday evening overseeing rehearsals for their production of All Is Calm. Being an integral part and a, and a, and a producing body and an artistic mind behind a theater company um, was always one of my dreams. Why don't we do it for real? Come on, you scum sucking runt of a man! Double or nothing! Vic is proof that the dream doesn't always have to be bright lights and red carpets. Sometimes that dream is dusty roads 
day playing with the likes of Tommy Lee Jones and Morgan Freeman, and finding your way into a black box theater on a cold fall evening, overseeing the creation of work for which you lead the charge. Give me the money! And if you're wondering if Vic ever met that girl by becoming an actor... I'm, I met my wife um, doing a film. It was like 2003, 2004, and uh, we kind of, you know, just hit it off, and I've been with her ever since. <laughs> We are not done on this episode of Legendary New Mexico. After the break, find out what you can do to keep the industry thriving. The New Mexico State Legislature has taken proactive measures to keep business booming when it comes to film, which is a good thing considering all the work and all the risk that goes into making one. Making a movie is like constructing a house of cards. You need a solid script, a producer who believes in it, and can assemble the right production team, including directors, cinematographers, associate producers, and of course, the cast. Then there's the production, securing locations, adhering to tight deadlines, in which failure can literally cost millions of dollars. Take all that footage into post-production, editing, coloring, sound design, and distribution, and if you're lucky, audiences will come see that movie, and maybe even like it. Can I guarantee somebody that if they're from New Mexico and they write a script that Netflix is going to pick it up? Absolutely not. In fact, the film industry is notoriously short on guarantees, yet it is still considered to be one of the most attractive fields of work in the land of enchantment, an industry that is literally bursting at the seams. Last year our direct spend was $525 million, so that means $525 million that was not here before is coming in from the film industry. And that's pretty extraordinary. In addition to that direct spend, it is estimated that the industry employs and supports more than 8,000 jobs. That comes in third place for most employment in the state behind Los Alamos National Labs and Sandia National Labs. We are one of the only states to have um, actual distributors move here, put down roots, and become part of our community. In 2019, lawmakers bumped the tax cap up from $50 million annual payout to $100 million, greatly increasing the attraction of New Mexico for producers. In terms of inquiries, uh, they're up about two-thirds. But keeping the industry thriving isn't just up to lawmakers. Secretary Keyes estimates that 40% of money spent by film productions goes to locally owned businesses. But businesses have to get out there and make themselves known. I would say if you are a local vendor, please, please, please register on the New Mexico Film website because it's used. And private citizens can play a vital role as well when it comes to keeping the industry thriving. I would just say lend your support during the legislative session. If you have a legislator that you know is anti-film, reach out to them. Say, actually, you know, my dry cleaning business, we get 10% of our work from the film industry. So just letting people know that it does affect you. While there are so many moving parts to making a movie, New Mexico has, through trial and error, created an environment that attracts producers over competition like Georgia and Louisiana. And with a little business savvy, increased training, and yes, luck, our state finds itself on the verge of becoming the next big thing in the biz. 16 years of having an industry is responsible for having Netflix here because they would have never come here if the crew base wasn't here. They would have never come here if we were too far from LA. They would have never come here if the legislation wasn't right. They would have never come here if the sun, you know, if our community wasn't so wonderful with them or we didn't have 300 days of sunshine. So it was it was a mix of everything, and then it was just kind of the, the bow that was tied at the end. Well, Netflix and NBC Universal both have 10-year, $1 billion deals for production. They're also giving back to the state in outreach and education. Well, that's going to do it for us on this edition of Legendary New Mexico. If you want more information or previous episodes in their entirety, just head over to legendarynewmexico.com.